Good day to everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Centre for Food Policy February 2021 Food Thinkers webinar. Our 2021 Food Thinkers seminar series brings together women redesigning food systems. Big ideas from women in academia, policy, business and advocacy on redesigning food systems. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Agnes Calabrata, the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy of the UN Food Systems Summit. She'll be talking to us about what it will take to deliver on the promise of the Food Systems Summit in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals with extensive opportunity for a Q&A session. My name is Corinna Hawkes. I'm director of the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London, and I'll be hosting Dr. Calabarta and you all today and hosting the Q&A. So Dr. Calabarta is a distinguished speaker today. She works uh, with the UN system and key partners to provide leadership guidance and strategic direction towards the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Since 2014, she's also served as president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Prior to that, she was Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources between 2008 and 2014, and has held other leadership positions as well, such as the Permanent Secretary of the Minister of Agriculture and Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Rwanda. She has been awarded numerous prizes and awards for her work as an agricultural scientist, policymaker, and thought leader. And she holds a doctorate in entomology from the University of Massachusetts. The Calabarta, it's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome you this evening. We're very much looking forward to what you have to say. I just wanted to mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available online afterwards. Uh, we will be taking questions and answers, plenty of time for that. Please post them not into the chat, but into the Q&A. Anything that is posted in the, into the chat will be reposted into the Q&A. And if you want to tweet, please do, but please listen first and foremost. But if you want to tweet, our handle is at Food Policy City and the hashtag Food Thinkers. So with no further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Calabarta, over to you. Thank you for those introductory remarks, uh, Corina. I've been looking forward to being part of this conversation. And I will do, uh, I will do two things. I will make a presentation, um, a brief presentation to you all to give you context and help you understand where the Food System Summit is at. And then I'll take questions from you all. So, uh, um, if you can change and go to the next slide. So, the Food System Summit was launched um, in 2019 on World Food Day with really three goals in mind. Um, the Secretary General had um, two th th one thing that was extremely urgent in his mind. Uh, we have signed up to the, uh, to the SDGs, to the uh, 2030 Agenda. And one year to five years then, which, which it was basically four years to, to, to us reaching five years of SDGs, we were not doing well. For example, on hunger, we were moving backwards. We had, hunger had been increasing for, for, for five years now. We know that hunger has been increasing for six years in a row now. And probably because of COVID, it has also gone uh, much higher. Um, and and a number of other things, we know that um, we still have nutritional related challenges because of obesity. Uh, in fact, um, the, the nutritional related diseases are now called the slow pandemic that is fueling the COVID pandemic. We now know that food systems from production to all the way to, to um, transport and, and how we process food and put it on the table, farm to fork basically is contributing significantly to emissions. But we also know, uh, and, and COVID has done a lot to trust that, that, that really we have uh, vulnerabilities in our systems that we need to worry about, including, including really uh, resilience that we need to be building, which was a challenge even before we came uh, to COVID. So 
when the Secretary General launched this, he was really like, he wanted to unleash bold action towards the 2030 agenda. We can't be talking about the 2030 agenda and not come through. So, so the request was that we take this summit out there, we take it to people, we have a conversation around the globe, we allow people to have an opportunity to have a conversation around the globe, and then we come up with bold action and very ambitious action that might help us come through in the remaining 20, 10 years. So that's why the, the, the 10 years we just started is actually called the decade of action for the food system summit, but also it's a decade of action of so many other goals that are associated with the development agenda and food systems basically touches near each and every one of the 17 um, uh, SDGs. If you go to the next slide, please. So what, one of a number of, we will be doing a number of things. One of them is to, to really uh, elevate public discourse and make sure that Food Systems Summit is out there. We are discussing it, but also we are thinking about what needs, what type of transitions our food systems need, need to be um, undertaking so that we can improve the well being of people and planet now that we understand very well that a number of things uh, are impacted, just like I started describing. We need to, as a result of that, we really need to take it out there. And that's why I said we need to make it a people's summit. We need to think of action. So really coming up with measurable outcomes that will help us achieve the 2030 goals is the primary objective of the Food System Summit, recognizing that we are impacting, um, we, we need to be impacting them, that, but also recognizing that we are working in a landscape where we need to be very conscious of the ecosystem we are working in. We need to come up with a way of measuring uh, what we are doing. Once we put actions out there, we need to come up with a way of measuring them and tracking them and being able to hold each other accountable and even being able to see if we are making progress. So really um, what we would be looking for is that we change how we think about our food systems, that we have a global conversation around how we think about our food systems, that we mobilize action and significant action around how we come through on the 2030 agenda. And that around that action, we actually have an, an accountability mechanism that allows us to hold each other accountable. So next slide. So uh, because of two things, because action and 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 uh, and uh, and uh, taking the food system summit to people were upmost in our minds. We designed the summit so that we can mobilize significant action. Number one, number two, so that we can actually have um, the summit as a people's summit uh, and and really give people an opportunity to have a dialogue that allows them to feel that they've been engaged and they're part of the solutions we are discussing. So that here I present to you the summit structures. And the summit structures are really uh, guided by, by those two things. So we have the advisory committee, which is mostly ma made of member states, but also a few um, representation from different parts of our, of our, of our society. Like um, uh, we have indigenous people representation, we have youth representation, we have private sector representation and a and, you know, um, number of other representations. So the advisory committee is chaired by the deputy secretary general. Then we do have um, the special envoy and the office of the special envoy, which is the secretariat. Then we do have, um, beyond below that, then we do have the different groups. We do have uh, a scientific group, uh, uh, an independent group of scientists, uh, about 25 scientists, that really, whose job is really to look at some of the things we'll be looking at at the summit and, and looking at their scientific base, if we are suggesting any new direction, any transition in our food systems, what's the evidence and the base of these type of transitions we are talking about? Um, and the scientific group would have to validate uh, that type of transition in our system. That transition is going to come from the work we are doing in action tracks. So we have action tracks, which are really looking at the, what we are calling the objectives of the summit. Now, the first one being access to safe and nutritious food, the second one being looking at consumption patterns, behavior, including food waste. The third one being uh, nature positive production, recognizing really that, that how we produce food is part of the problem. Uh, like I said earlier, all the way to the fork. Um, so that is looking at our carbon footprint. The fourth one being how we 
you know, how we impact livelihoods and recognizing that the need to impact livelihoods is probably one of the biggest challenges of our times today, especially as a result of COVID. And then the fifth one, recognizing that climate change was an issue even before COVID and we need to build resilience of communities that are experiencing climate change, but also we need to build resilience of production systems and other systems that are impacted by food systems. So that's what action trucks look at. The action trucks are complemented by uh, food systems dialogues. The food system dialogues are three sets. We have three sets of types of dialogues. We have member state dialogues, which recognizes that countries will have to, to really have a conversation around their food systems, look at what is working, what's not working, think through solutions that they have that they can that can be part of being scaled. And, and really help solve some of the challenges they are seeing, but also some of the, the solutions they can borrow from what is being discussed in action tracks. We do have um, then independent dialogues, recognizing fully well that the, the member state space may not necessarily be where everybody else will go. There will be farmers communities that may want to dialogue. There will be private sector, there will be indigenous communities, being able to give them space and civil society being able to give them space to dialogue and provide solutions themselves, but also really have an opportunity to discuss the problems they are facing is important. We then have global dialogues. And the global dialogues are really intended to take advantage of all the other dialogues that are happening, recognizing the Food system Summit is about the different things that touch our lives. And those things are actually already happening, whether it's the Nutrition for Growth Summit, we need to tap into that and ensure that we take on some the, many of the recommendations they are making. Whether it is the COP26, which is coming up, the biodiversity COP, which is coming up, uh, and a number of other meetings, the Oceans meet, uh, Summit, which is coming up. All these meetings are very critical to food systems, and we need to incorporate uh, what they are coming up with and make sure that they are part of what we take on. We cannot not take on uh, those elements that are coming out of these meetings. So that's part of what we are calling the global dialogues. And our engage, we are very intentional around how we engage with this, those dialogues. We do have the UN task force, recognizing fully well that the UN has a lot of institutions. Now this task force have, has now today about 36 institutions that have come together. And we are trying to look at how we use that, the, the effort and energy and science and all the stuff that the UN system is doing and how we can use it to, to enhance and enrich what the summit is doing. Um, it's coordinated by UNEP and UNDP. And uh, the, through them, then uh, the, the, it finds its way to the summit. Um, we have a, a, a champions network. The champions network is to help us take, to, to the, take the summit to people way beyond the action tracks, the scientific group and the food systems dialogues, really find people out there and, and let's take it to our network. So we've signed up champions and we're still signing up champions and we want them to take this dialogue to, to, to uh, the dialogues and the summit process and the summit conversations to people out there and make sure that it's not just a few people, it's many people that are having this conversation and many networks that are being brought in. And through the champions network, we give people an opportunity to actually engage with other parts of the summit. We put in place a digital platform, recognizing fully well that there are people that won't make it to any of these things anyway. And, and through the digital platform, we want food systems heroes. We want all sorts of people that want to sign up to also have the opportunity to sign up and engage with the summit. The summit then comes together in a pre-summit in, in, in July in, in, in Italy under the leadership of the government of Italy. And then, um, the summit will happen in September uh, uh, alongside the, the General Assembly, Assembly, which is happening in September. Next slide. I've really described the scientific group and the expectation from the scientific group. This slide here shows you that um, they are looking at a number of issues. They are looking at modeling. They are looking at policy, uh, uh, policy briefs that will be coming out and they are looking at different thematic papers based on the different areas I told you. They'll be looking at um, uh, there are a number of cross-cutting issues as well. For example, how do we finance many of these things? So we have finance as a cross-cutting lever. We do have women and youth as, as cross-cutting um, 
uh, issues we need to look at and, and the number of, of other human rights and, and uh, a number of other areas that we think are critical to look at. So many, pep many papers are being developed uh, on the critical areas that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, objectives of the summit, but so are um, papers being developed on some of these cross-cutting issues. Uh, this, the conversations in, 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 um, in dialogue, these dialogues that we're having across, across the, the world, across countries will also be really an opportunity for the scientific group to check and see what is coming out of countries, but also to feedback on what they are seeing that countries are putting forward and independent dialogues are putting forward. So next slide. I've discussed action tracks in detail. Here, this just tells you how our action tracks are structured. One of the things we looked at is um, to try to make sure that we provide space for civil society. Uh, most of the action tracks are chaired by uh, different institutions, which are mostly uh, civil society. The vice chairs of these action tracks, um, we've, we have two vice chairs. There's a youth vice chair recognizing that food systems really is about the future. And we need to give young people an opportunity to engage in what we think is the most important uh, part of, of our times of our generation today to, to really think through what we do about our food system. So giving them an opportunity to be part of this conversation was a deliberate action of this uh, summit. And then the vice chairs are coming in depending on, on uh, if really to ensure that we have different parts of the globe covered. So many times where we have a chair coming from the north, then the vice chair from the south, just to ensure that uh, different views are brought on the table. Uh, they are reinforced uh, with the uh, members of the scientific group. So the scientific group has assigned uh, different members to the action tracks to ensure that the conversations that are coming up really are, are, are reflective of, of, the, the, of, of the science as we know it, of where we are coming from, but also of where we are going. And that it, it also allows us to trigger conversations in the science world that will be supportive and providing evidence around what we should be thinking through as we come, through, we come to what we are calling game-changing ideas coming from the scientific, um, from the action tracks. So really to enforce the conversation and ensure that the conversation is, is anchored in science and evidence of, of the necessary transitions that we might, we might be having. Next slide. I see um, a comment that slides are not clear and, and I don't know what's going on, but from where I'm sitting, they are, they are clear. Uh, so uh, we might share the slides also if, if you want them shared later. Now, this is really to enforce what we said around uh, the type of dialogues, member state dialogues. Uh, we've already, in terms of update, we not now have over um, 35 member states have already uh, submitted interest to participate in dialogues, which is extremely important. And we think that by end of, um, of this month, most of the countries will have already started the dialogues. So the interest is huge. And we are happy to, to really see this type of interest because it gives countries an opportunity to participate and discuss their own food systems, recognizing very well that food systems are local. We can't really globalize food systems. We need solution at local level. Uh, global food systems are happening already. We did, we did engage with um, the One Planet Network. We did engage with energy. We are looking forward to engaging with UNEA. And, and the number of others that are coming up. So really just to make sure that we are benefiting from these summits and we are taking input from these summits to enhance what we are doing. Independent dialogues are also starting. There's a lot of interest. Last week I was talking to the, to, uh, the farmers leaders and across the world um, and, and there's already interest to start farmers um, independent dialogues happening but I, I also know that there are a number of other dialogues happening. There are regional dialogues happening. For example, I know that NEPAD here in Africa is mobilizing uh, the African uh, dialogues across African countries to make sure that, that they build on frameworks that the continent already has. And, um, and uh, we, we are getting a lot of support from um, the UN system, uh, FAO, um, World Food Program, IFAD, but also resident coordinators of these countries are supporting to ensure that these dialogues are happening. Next slide. 
The Champions Network is designed, like I said earlier, to really ensure that people are coming to the summit processes. We meet twice a, a month and that they are learning from the summit process and what they are learning, they are sharing, but also they are giving us an opportunity to learn what they are learning from the networks they have. So that's, it's really built as a, 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 a feedback mechanism that is, is back and forth that allows people to understand what the summit is doing, but also allows champions to create networks that they can feedback into. Uh, and I hope this, this is working well. Uh, and um, as the network grows, I hope that we have an opportunity to really reach as many people as possible. And of course, this is complemented, like I said earlier, by Food Systems Heroes. These are just thousands of people that want to know about the summit and can do so by logging in, in the, uh, using the digital platform and providing any form of feedback. Next slide. <clears throat> This, uh, the food systems community is, is, the, is how we call our digital platform. And we are hoping that this community can be mobilized and brought together and really just be out there to champion the food system, but also use the platform as again, like I said earlier, as, as an opportunity to feedback. Next slide. So this is my last slide. And, um, this one is, is, uh, is, uh, it shows major events that are happening um, really from the perspective of some of the, the meetings we want to take advantage of. We want to make sure that the, 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 the meeting, the, the food systems uh, conversation and, and summit really gives and provides an opportunity for uh, dialogue with, around food, but it is not about food. It's about the food systems and the system under which we produce food. It's not about hunger. It's really about all the things that, that, um, that we do to impact our world and how our world impacts us. And so, we, we, like I said earlier, we, we, we are very conscious of, of tracking and, and, and making sure that we take advantage of, um, of all the meetings that are happening, that we are ensuring that the, in the conversation around food security is happening, especially because we know now that many more people are hungry today than they were before, that the conversations are happening around nutrition and health, nature and climate, social justice and, and livelihoods, but also the whole SDG agenda uh, keeps, we would have to keep coming together through these conversations. At the end of the day, my primary responsibility is to ensure that we elevate the conversation around how we come through on SDGs given that we have 10 years to go. And given that, uh, again, the challenges we see in our landscape means that if we continue at this, at, at the pace we are working at, would never be able to come through. So I'll end there and I will take any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, uh, Agnes, uh, for setting that out also very uh, clearly for our, um, our audience. And uh, thanks for the audience for listening and beginning to pose those questions. Thanks very much, and, and that was really very clear about, about the, the summit and the promise of the summit. If I can start uh, with a with a question, Agnes, your presentation showed just how passionate you are about the potential of the Food Systems Summit to unite the global community uh, around food, uh, all the different people that are engaged and involved. What is it about your connection to food that makes you feel so passionately about it? So that's an interesting question. Um, you know, um, it's it's it goes very far, but really in a nutshell, to keep cut the long story short, I grew up in an environment where I, I got to appreciate the place and role of food, not just to feed our bodies, but as a livelihood. So I grew up as a as a, a, a daughter of a smallholder farmer whose livelihood was really about how they produced food and how they sold food to people who needed the food. So I, I appreciate from that perspective that there's a whole community that depends on how well they produce food and makes livelihoods from making, producing food. And actually that community is able to put forward people like myself who wouldn't be here if it wasn't the fact that small farmers farm and send their kids to school. So that's number one. But then I really got an opportunity after that. I mean, I was Minister of Agriculture in Rwanda. I, I worked in research at, uh, in the CGIR. So I do know the potential to use food to empower people. I've, whether you use the, the technological base of food, having farmers access good varieties, 
and be able to double what they produce or even triple. We know we are producing so much more than we did before because of science. Being able to get science in the hands of farmers is an opportunity I had because I was in government and I had the opportunity to really see where science and policy can meet and transform people's lives. So really my belief in food comes from the fact that I've seen it in action in terms of how it can transform people's lives, not to just feed people, but transform people's lives. And there is a significant part of our world that depends on food for their livelihoods. So really that's, that's where my, my, uh, my belief comes from, but also knowing that we can support these people to have decent livelihoods with what they do. Well, transforming people's lives is very much what the SDGs uh, is, is about and indeed what all the solutions spoken about are. You've shared the vision for the idea that the, this is a solutions summit. What solutions have you experienced in your own long career in food, which you really think can make a difference to improving the food system? So, uh, you know, when the, the approach I take to agriculture, for example, and uh, food, the food perspective in the part of the world I live in is that what we are trying to do here in Africa, for example, <clears throat> to help farmers uh, feed themselves uh, is, is not something that, um, that is rocket science. It's something that has been happening forever. I'm going to excuse myself and, chat and connect my computer, sorry. Do keep the questions and answers coming in the way. Lots there already. Do put them into the Q&A, not the chat, please. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry about that. I was saying that, um, you know, some of the solutions, like I said earlier, are based on simple things like accessing better varieties, right? That can help farmers improve some of the, the, the land rest varieties that, that they use that actually um, are producing so much less because they are being attacked by pests and diseases. So that's one solution. That makes a whole lot of difference for farmers when used with the right nutrition um, and also when agronomy is, is applied right. Irrigation is an opportunity that we have to be able to increase farmers' yields and give them a better livelihood. Um, I mean, insurance right now, given climate change, is an opportunity we have that we can, we can, uh, we can use. So there are a number of things we can do that I see they really present an opportunity to give farmers better means than they have today. And they're not record science because we've been doing this forever in agricultural systems. Great, thank you, Agnes, for sharing uh, those, uh, those uh, optimistic uh, solutions with us. Um, Alice has got a question here that I'd like to ask to begin with from the audience. Imagine that the summer is a success. What would you hope that it will catalyze um, uh, imagining the summit's its success, what will you hope it will catalyze or achieve over the next three to five years towards the SDGs? Agnes, I'm afraid we can't hear you. So uh, um, I'm saying that, uh, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. Um, I was saying that given what we now know of, um, of SDGs, like I said earlier, there's an opportunity to look at how we can help people reduce hunger, right? And the, uh, the number of studies have been done, most recently the ZEF report, but also the series report that show that the amount of money that we need to deal with hunger is really not that much compared to the problem we have now dealing with COVID, something that happened because people are trying to get a livelihood. So there's an opportunity to actually fix some of these problems and we do have the means to do it. We just have to raise that ambition and want to come through for other people. But I think there's also an opportunity now with COVID where we do recognize and realize that these problems are not as local as we think. 
whether it's climate change. I mean, right now, my part of the world is experiencing a lot of climate change. People are not, people's yields have gone down significantly and they, they didn't, they're not even significantly contributing to climate change. But, and, and so is COVID. COVID happens locally and then becomes a global problem. So we are not now recognizing even more than we did before that these problems are, are not as local as we think, that these problems impact part of mankind, impact all of us, and we need to be doing something about them. So it's not that we don't have the means. I think it's not, it's just that we really have not thought through how interlinked our world is and how these problems are linked and how solving them is a win-win for all of us. All, another, another way I could look at it is that uh, we have farming communities in my part of the world that also should be giving their part. Their part is reduce degradation of landscapes. Their part is, you know, um, you know, do a better job and try to, to get informed on what is going on. And we will work with them and help them understand that. And that's why we're having these conversations with governments and making sure that governments, including our own governments here, understand what is at stake and understand how we are impacting the, the environment. So I do hope that all of us with this type of summit, with this type of conversation that we are taking to every community, that we are actually giving people an opportunity to ask themselves what their part is in the problems that we now see and how they can be part of solving these problems, how we can help them solve these problems. So really elevate that conversation, elevate that discourse, give people an opportunity and, and then start asking for commitments around what we could do differently. What can we do differently as individuals? What do we do differently as communities? What do we do differently as countries? What do we do differently as a world that sees ourselves at crossroads with nature? So we're well, all responsibility for everyone. I, I've got a couple of questions here, technical questions about the nature of, of the summit. Um, Camilla is asking, can anyone be a champion or, or a food hero? Um, there's so many people who want to be involved. Can anyone be a champion or, or a hero? And Louise is asking about the process to prepare um, a high, the high level call to action from the summit. So I had the first part around, can anyone be a hero or a champion? Anyone can be a hero. A, a champion is restricted. The ability to be a champion is restricted by how much we as a secretariat, which is a pretty small team, can engage. Really, we, we just have so much to do. And we want to make sure that we have, um, we have a, a, a network from our, our community, from our globe, really global network that allows us to engage people and, and help ensure that these people are also connected to larger networks. So we can only engage them and we don't have the capacity to engage everybody. So we are looking to probably have a max of about 100 people uh, that, that, are able, that we are able to engage directly and, and have them engage their networks and through their networks really reach, uh, cascade, really have huge networks behind them. But in terms of signing up and getting to know what the, the, the summit is doing, and contributing ideas as, as a food hero, everybody's free to and, and welcome to do that. But the second part Wait, of the question you. I did here. Uh, sorry, yes, um, about the high level outcome document of the, of the summit, what, what is the process of getting to that? Uh, the high level outcome document of the summit is going to be a, a, an SG document. So, um, the, the Secretary General is going to look at the process of the summit, look at what we've been able to achieve and really work, you know, come up with a statement that tells the world what we are going to be doing in the next 10 years based on what we've agreed and what we've discussed. It will be accompanied by different forms of commitments from governments, from private sector, from all of us. And uh, Hilda asked, what's the best way for ordinary people, as she puts it, uh, to become involved in the dialogues? So dialogues are happening at country level. And um, um, we have, the way it is structured right now, every country provides a convener. Uh, uh, the, the role of the convener really is to ensure that the key ministries, and, and here I'm, I'm being very intentional because sometimes people think that dialogues, these dialogues and the food system is about 
um, is about food, but no, it's actually about about four or five sectors that impact food, and and bringing those sectors together and show that they are part of the dialogue that is happening is important. So we are looking. We've asked uh, the uh, deputy secretary general has asked countries, each country, to step forward and bring a convener, and we will be asking that convener to bring those ministries together, bring the conversation, engage private sector, engage all different different types of people in those conversations. But also, we provided a platform, an online uh, independent uh, dialogue platform that allows other people to engage. These people are mostly going to be people that have something in common, right? That are farmers, that are again, private sector, civil society, that want to dialogue. So those people can come there that kind of way. And people can sign up, or young people, they can sign up depending on which group they want to be part of and engage in those dialogues. So right now there are trainings that are going on. Uh, so we've, we, we've, we, we are working with um, David Nabarro, who is really uh, ensuring that these dialogues um, have a, a, a way, uh, in, I mean, that people understand the manner in which they are being conducted and the, the, the trainings are happening at country level so that the conveners do understand how to bring in people, how to have people sign up. But I think there's also an open sign up process where at country level you can, you can engage with the conveners. And once we know the conveners, we also make them public so that people know, can approach them. Once we have independent dialogues going on, we also make them public so that people can engage. Great, thanks for, for that clarification. Now, there's a whole bunch of questions that are coming in about science um, that's going to be um, used as input into, um, into the summit. One, um, so I'll just bunch some of those together, Alan, Mallory, Claire. Uh, how will the expert research, which is coming out on a daily basis, including in the last couple of days, Going, going to be used in the summit. But also, what are the tensions around this? Because we know that scientific research has been uh, undertaken much more so in certain areas than others. And, and Claire gives the example that there's been more with scientific research supporting uh, more conventional modern forms of agriculture uh, and industrialized agriculture is the term she uses compared with agroecological agro techniques. And uh, Mallory has the, makes the point about how to make sure that the, the science is being used uh, and these other points coming in about how to make sure that because there's more science in some areas than others, how to make sure that's, that's balanced out. This is a, a tough challenge, I suppose. I imagine, the, the, yeah, that's a, it's, it, there are major challenges out there that we have to, to sort through, um, that the scientific community is going to have to, to sort through as they look at um, some of the ideas we are proposing and we bring them forward. I think uh, the part where we want the science to, to work a lot is when we start looking at the type of transitions we need to be having and being able to tell us why those transitions are important for our food systems, number one, and why those transitions are not more mistakes in our world that actually are taking us to a better place. And these, are, these scientists are experts that have been doing a whole lot of science before. We are, they are not amateurs, they are people that have been in the landscape and they have huge networks. They are not doing science, they are not doing research to tell us where the summit is going. They are, look, they are reviewing research, they are reviewing work that is out there. And they are working with the FAO, their anchor is, is, is in, they have a huge anchor in FAO as well. They are working with CFS. There's a whole lot of information that they have to build on. As you're saying, there's agroecology on one hand, there's industrial agriculture on another hand, there's green revolution on another hand, there's agroecology on another hand. How do you bring all these things together and be able to tell the world that this is probably not as great or as good anymore that we need to be you know forging another future for ourselves defining another path, path for ourselves and this is what this path is going to look like one of the tension points for example that keeps coming up is the role of subsidies and how they are being used are they used for the good of the world that they used for right now are they not as good as they should be can they be rethought and be used better so some of those tensions are, are all being discussed. Someone yesterday was telling me that we should not use 
the word trade off because it means bad things, but definitely the idea of looking at what type of, uh, of trade offs are we looking at? What do we leave and, and what does it mean? And what are we taking on and what does it mean? But the bottom line is we really should be using sales to give us a certain degree of comfort that where we are doing is, is much better for the well being of our planet and, and, and well being of, of people. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Agnes, uh, uh, for, for that um, uh, chat, uh, dealing with that, uh, that, that challenge. So there's um, uh, some questions here about youth and young people uh, in the summit. Uh, so Isabel and um, Emily, thank you for your questions. Uh, Isabel says it's great to see that there's a youth representation on the scientific group, but will there be a moment in the Food Systems Summit uh, where young farmers can interact and exchange um, experiences. And um, Emily says, what is your advice for a young person wanting to raise awareness of sustainable food systems and gain a platform in this area? I think that really sounds great. Um, like I said, from an independent dialogue perspective, we can have young farmers dialogue you know, it, we can have young farmers come together and start a dialogue that allows them to share notes, that allows them to say, this is what we think is probably the biggest and best idea um, from a farming perspective that can go forward. I'm not saying that that idea will necessarily be taken forward, but at least it will be given light of day in terms of being looked at um, from, from an, an idea perspective and being really scrutinized to see if the, it, it might be one of our game changers of our, of our world. One of the things I've been saying is game changers are not necessarily going to come from scientific paper. They're going to come from practitioners. They're going to come from people who do these things every day. They're going to come from farmers. They're going to come from indigenous people that live this world uh, and, th and this life. They're going to come from businesses who live this every day. People who meet, see these problems every day and have a way of thinking about solutions are going to be part of contributing those ideas. And my hope would be that as we take them forward, we actually have a few that come from young people because they've, they've looked at them or they have experienced them through, through some of the things they are doing. And we can really take them on and use them in terms of engaging Again, they can, young people can participate in independent dialogues. We do have a forum separately for young people, uh, which we are trying to grow and which as we go deeper into this summit, we are going to make sure that they, they are center stage. Like I told you earlier, we, we are trying to do everything that, to make sure that youth are given center stage. And as we go, we get closer, we are going to make sure that we provide even more space. We haven't had the capacity, but now we do. So we are really going to double down on our efforts on, on, on working with young people. But right now I would encourage them to participate in the dialogues, to create that independent dialogue space, to ask for support from David and start their own dialogues. Great, excellent to see those opportunities. There's another bunch of questions um, that have, have come in about the challenge of keeping the food system within planetary boundaries. And to do that, uh, reflecting on the use of um, food justice and also issues around rights, um, saving seeds, organic production, reducing the impact of input suppliers such as pesticides and moving away from that, that model towards a model uh, which um, uh, many believe uh, will not keep our food systems and the planetary boundaries. So Mike, Frank, and a whole range of other people have asked questions along those lines. Uh, we'd love to hear your reflections on that. Good, very good. Uh, listen, I think the reason we are having food systems dialogues is because we are trying not to be prescriptive. We are trying to give people a choice and an opportunity to discuss how they can fix the challenges of food systems, recognizing fully well that we are we have a number of challenges, beginning with not being able to feed ourselves in some places and, and be living outside our planetary boundaries in many other places. So incidentally, there are going to be cases where feeding ourselves is paramount and feeding people is paramount. But the process, for example, here in Africa, the process of 
getting farmers to feed themselves using what is at their hands, which is land and, and, and rain-fed agriculture is actually at the expense of more land because they're not producing enough, they don't have enough inputs, so they get more land into agriculture. Now, we have to balance that with helping them get access to inputs that can help them produce more with less and save more land. Uh, but I'm not going trying to be prescriptive here. I'm just trying to say we have choices. We have trade-offs to make. And those choices are going to have to be, we are not going to starve people. That is out of the question so that we can save the environment. That's not going to happen. But we are going to have to understand how we create a balance between using our environment to feed people and feed people and have them have decent livelihoods and, and save our environment because we are not going to crush our world either. So it's finding that balance. And again, it's going to be country by country. It's going to be situation by situation. And I cannot be prescriptive here, but I need us to recognize that that balance has to be created locally. Thank you. And, and you mentioned livelihoods there. Paula has a question here about alternative livelihoods for farmers <coughs> who might not be part of this transformed food system. How uh, will resources, how will resources be allocated to en ensure a just transition uh, for these uh, for these farmers? So, um, again, a just transition can be looked at many ways, but say, for example, and farmers means they are farming, right? But if you wanted, if we wanted as a world, we decided that, you know what, farming in this type of landscape is not sustainable anymore. There has to be a just transition, right? I've seen examples uh, where, just to give you a, a very good example, I've seen in Rwanda, uh, my, my home country, where we, we've we've been working on on ensuring that we save the mountain gorilla, which is the last one of the last, I mean, the last species of its kind that that, that exists, and 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 if we are not careful, could face extinction. So my country has a choice to make, right? The choice is we 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 preserve this environment for this mountain gorilla, but the environment is highly encroached, right? Part of ensuring that those farmers have a livelihood has had to be a transition for them to move from farming and to increase the land available for mountain gorillas. But the economy that is being built around that actually ensures that those farmers have a livelihood, have transitioned into a different form of economy. They are part of the tourism economy they actually make money from tourism. They are not required to farm to have a livelihood, but it's a process and we have to educate them and we have to ensure that they can be, they can manage that new livelihood. We have to really give them the, the necessary tools to help them survive and live that, in that livelihood. So these are some of the things we are going to have to think through. When we think through about rehabilitating our environment, when we think through reducing footprint on the environment, some of the choices we are going to have to make is how we support communities that are directly dependent on the environment to actually be able to transition from that dependence if there's another livelihood that can be created. But it's not something they can do on their own and we, we need to understand our role and place in making that happen. It has to be a shared responsibility. Indeed, thank you. Uh, Molly's got a question here. You mentioned the importance of, of narrative uh, and the uh, one of the outcomes of this summit about the narrative about food systems. What, what do you believe should be part of this narrative? And do you see any opposing narratives uh, coming up against that? Against the food system narrative. So the food system narrative uh, uh, for me, go ahead. No. I was just uh, sorry to, to clarify. So, what what do you think should be in the narrative coming out of the summit, and do you see any opposing narratives to that? I think the the, the narrative we are looking for um, going to the food system summit and 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 beyond is that we we it's within our means. You know, it's within our means. We have the science behind us. We have the means behind us. It's within our means to stay within the planetary boundaries. It's within our means to stop waging, as the, the Secretary General called it the other day, waging a war with nature. It's, it's, it's something we can, we can do this. It's something we can do. 
And we can start by coming through on SDGs. We have the resources. We have much more resources than we need, but we also have the ambition and we have, we can build the partnerships and the coalitions that can help us come through. Probably not one institution can do it, not one country can do it. And it's true, not, none, none of us can do it individually, but we can, as a people, form the right level of coalitions and partnerships to be able to come through on this. So I, I, and then probably for me, the most important thing, we also have the opportunity. What we are seeing right now, the rate at which environmental challenges have been coming up suggests that we probably at really the last stretch of stretching our environment. So for me, I don't see any contrary narrative. I don't see anybody who is going to tell me that we are wrong, that we are not coming through on SDGs, that we are wrong, that we are doing the right thing by the environment, that we are wrong, that there's other two generations or three generations ahead of us that can fix this. I, only, I think that we are probably the, the luckiest generation to be in a position where we can be able to do something about our environment while changing our food systems, while changing livelihoods at the same time. So I think we have a huge opportunity and I don't see that there's a polar or contrary narrative. Great, thank you. Now, one of the questions that often comes up and, and you'll be familiar with this is about the role of different interests in the system. We know that the food system, uh, despite the opportunities and <coughs> shared narrative is, is full of different interests. And sometimes those, uh, often in fact, those interests uh, conflict. So there's quite a few questions about this and I'll, I'll pose the ones that Alison Stewart and Eugene have put in. Um, the first one is about what do you hope to see by engaging with business, including small and large food companies, investors and finance? And the other questions are saying, how will you manage? Is there going to be a formally published uh, statement about how you are going to manage the fact that there are these different interests, some people would say conflicts of interest in the system, particularly uh, with large companies. Can you give some insights about what your reflections are on these, on these tricky issues? Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of dealing with business, the way I've been looking at business is um, small businesses are probably um, you know, they, they are challenged a lot, especially with COVID, a lot of them have been challenged and, and um, a lot of them will have to rethink their path and, 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 and really we have to, to think through how we help them, you know, get back on their feet in this landscape post COVID. But when I look at big businesses, there are opportunities for big businesses to think through how they, their businesses impact people, how their businesses can, can really be part of contributing to the betterment of society. And the good thing is, I think they've been stepping forward. They are looking for opportunities. We've been pushing around, um, you know, the, the social bit that they've been engaging around is not working enough. You know, uh, the, the, the trying to, to put up, um, I, I, I always forget this word because I don't like it. That social thing that businesses do so that they are coming through for people, which really some, many times doesn't happen. I mean, a recent study showed that 12% of the businesses that have signed up to coming through on SDGs and, 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 doing, and, and, and supporting SDGs, only 12% are doing what they signed up to do. So uh, they, they have a good talk, they talk a good talk, but being able to come through is still challenging. So we are doing a number of things. We are saying there are things that businesses can do together and these have to be big things and they need to commit to these big things. They can, if they're working with farming communities, they can commit to um, a living wage for farming communities they're working with. If they are dealing with waste, they can commit to zero waste. If they are dealing with uh, agriculture, they can commit to regenerative agriculture if this is where we are going. I mean, there are a number of things they can commit to and start really uh, ensuring that we are transitioning our, our world toward this. So, but there are also things they can commit to as individual businesses. So I, I'll be looking for big things they can commit to, which when, we, when they do together as businesses, they translate into major transitions in our systems. And then there are things they can do as individual businesses that done together across several businesses, across hundreds of businesses, they also allow to transition. I think here the most important thing 
is that we put in place a mechanism of tracking what people are saying and how well they come through. We have 10 years to, to track whether we can actually come through on this and to give them an opportunity to actually demonstrate they can come through on this. I think here the, the issue is everybody understands we have to do something different. We have to come through. And I, I've seen a lot of goodwill from business and, and I, I believe they are committed to coming through. I have no reason to think that this time they're not committed to coming through. Uh, thank you for those uh, reflections. Uh, Simon also has a question here about international trade policies. Again, can be quite a controversial area. Uh, what are your thoughts on the argument that international trade policies can um, be negative uh, to food security in, in developing countries? I mean, I, there, there, many of these things have a lot of evidence around them and a lot of science around them and a lot of research around them. I'm not going to go into what the, 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 the research says that's why we have a scientific and independent group, ex, group of, of experts that are going to look at some of these controversial issues and come up with a, with a, with a way forward. But definitely, uh, at least during COVID, you've had the conversation, shorter value chains versus longer value chains. Those conversations already are happening, whether we like it or not. The question is, are they necessarily uh, are they being forced by COVID or are they where we should be? You know, so, so, so part of, 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 of some of, uh, of, of what needs to be, would have to be debated during this, um, this summit and, and what action tracks are looking at and what the scientific groups are looking at is the implication of short value chains versus long value chains on livelihoods, on climate change, on on, on uh, food security and, and all these things have, uh, you know, have pros and cons and we have to, again, like I said, we have to find that place that minimizes impact on the environment while, the, while it does not undermine our ability to move forward as a people. Yeah, no, interesting on the short and long value chains question. Wendy has a question here about the role of women in food systems. Uh, she says, we already know that achieving sustainable food systems is only possible. Women everywhere are empowered and their rights are recognized and respected. We know that when women are empowered, food systems become more sustainable and efficient, but yet progress is so slow due to ingrained gender norms. How do we truly achieve change on gender equality? She would love your opinion on that, Agnes. So uh, this is one question that I grapple with every day because I can't tell you how many times in my line of work, I go to the field, I am going to meet a group of people and I find there are women and I'm, I'm, I'm like, what is the men? And they say, oh yeah, the men are in more interesting crops. So I say, but isn't this an interesting crop? They say, no. It is not marketable. <laughs> so, so I'm like, so what are you doing? <laughs> and then they'll tell me, oh, this is what, what feeds our, our families. So we are only allowed to, to do what feeds our families. And so for me, I, 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 it makes, I mean, it, it breaks my heart, to be honest, to, to feel like in this day and, and era, women are still in, in this space where, you know, you deal with what will feed our family, or deal with the money, you know, thing. Uh, and, and, and that happens as well on land issues, it happens as well, on business issues. And, and so it goes on and goes on. But I think if there was one thing that we would do differently, I, and I don't know how fast we would do it, being able to educate women, being able to educate them so that they understand what their, entire, what their rights are, what the world is ready to take and what's not. I mean, sometimes people feel that their world is just that, you, that small thing around them. But there's a much bigger world out there, and that much bigger world is more, more open than that small thing around them. And just being able to educate them that they are welcome to be part of the bigger world is extremely important. And I'm not sure that we are doing it enough. We just need to double down. So that's number one. Number two, they are overburdened. It, it also, the information may not get to them because they just are so much under so much weight that they have no time to come up for air and try to understand the world around them. So I think 
being able to find opportunities that lighten their weight, the weight on their shoulders so that they can be part of conversations that can help them broaden their scope. I mean, I grew up in a rural environment where I thought that my world started and ended with the small environment around me until I went to secondary school and started reading books and seeing that there's a whole world out there. So these women are stuck in those small worlds and those challenges that they, need, they have every day. And I think being able to just provide opportunities that allow them to broaden their scope. Now with, the, with telephones and, and local, you know, so things where they can access information. And now we have, uh, and really ensuring that digitization becomes part of how we reach women, we provide information. I mean, there are new tools now that we can use to reach women and we can be a little bit more deliberate about it. So, so I think it's, for, it's information, it's education. Thank you, Agnes. And Anna's got a question about the role of other UN agencies. And she particularly notes that, uh, for example, UN Women and the UN Population Fund could have a valuable contribution on women and health in the, um, in the food system. So what are the role of these other UN agencies? And there was another question earlier about the role of, of FAO as well. So what is the role of these other UN agencies, but particularly when it relates to um, these cross-cutting issues like gender in the food system? So from a food system perspective, the, the three Rome based agencies, the, the, what we call the RBAs, uh, have been, first of all, they are the anchor of this summit. This summit would not have happened without their support. They provided the support that we needed to, to take off in terms of really um, ensuring that the secretariat is up and running. We, we, got, we are getting support from all three Rome-based agencies. They are providing staff, they are providing resources in form of money, and they are providing the space we need to be able to do this work. In addition to that, the action track, the working action tracks is all anchor, is anchored in, in a number of UN institutions. FAO is taking responsibility and is, is, is supporting action track number one, which is about access to safe and nutritious food. Um, I think World Health Organization, if I'm not mistaken, is supporting action track number two. And, uh, and then um, action track number three, I think is UNEP. And, and action track number five is IFAD, number four, and then World Food Program. So, so they, are these, they are engaged in these action tracks. Now, through the UN task force that we have created, we also hope to be able to get inputs from other UN institutions um, in terms of what they can do to enhance the process uh, to, to ensure that what they see as part of the food systems can actually come through uh, the conversation um, that, uh, that happens within the UN task force. I'm looking forward, I honestly, I'm looking forward also to their contribution to the food system summit because they have so much in terms of what they've already done, what they've learned over the years. And then at country level, uh, the resident coordinator's office, the one UN system is, is, is coordinating, is supporting countries with dialogues and, and supporting uh, communities with, with independent dialogues. So we are really trying to make sure that they are engaged and that we are getting input from them. Great, so that's the UN agencies. There's a lot of questions about governments um, as, as well. Monica, Dahlia and, and many others are saying, what is going to make sure that the, um, the, the, what is agreed upon at the summit, and you've mentioned commitments, what are the mechanisms to ensure that will actually go ahead and, and that there will be accountability towards, uh, towards governments actually doing what they say they'll do? And, what gives you cause for optimism, given that governments have often committed and said they'll do things and then they don't? So accountability and, and commitment, how do you see that? Uh, one of the things that um, the, the UN Secretary General asked for as part of this summit is that we put in place an accountability mechanism that allows us to really continue, you know, rep continue reporting back so, so first of all, I forgot to mention that this is a voluntary summit. We are not negotiating anything. We are basing the summit on already negotiated ground on SDGs. So whatever is going to happen is going to be voluntary. Whatever is going to happen is going to be that people recognize the opportunity that the UN system offers, that when we do commit, we can make global commitments together and, and really 
really bank uh, and, 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 and use the backbone of the UN system to galvanize you know, action together. We can also use that to track how well we come back on, on the action we've committed to. So it's really, it's really um, something that people are going to have to do and countries are going to have to do because they know it's the right thing to do. But we will put in place and, 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 um, and businesses, but we will put in place a tracking mechanism that will at least will inform us as citizens at the end of the day, inform us as citizens and inform all of us whether what these countries committed to, whether what, what uh, we globally are committing to, businesses are committing to, whether we are coming through. We can't force people to do the right thing, but we can at least be able to talk about whether we are seeing the right thing happen. We can ask that the right thing get done and we can track how it gets done and we can report back. So all of us know whether we are appropriately represented or not. Governments are about people after all. They represent all of us. So what, if we really mean it as a people, we can actually ensure that our governments come through. So on the world of you can see there's hundreds of questions coming in here. Agnes, you're you're doing a brilliant job at, at mm -hmm. answering the quite intense questions uh, coming in. Uh, and in terms of accountability, I suppose that the bottom up, uh, the people uh, movements are also important. Um, Alwyn asks, what role do you see for citizen led responses to food sustainability challenges and community groups? Um, um, what role do you see them playing in transforming um, the, the food system? And she notes, and, and you did earlier as well, about how under COVID, uh, there's been a lot more short valley chains uh, come out uh, and uh, communities responding uh, to food insecurity. So what are the role of these citizen-led, community-led, smaller, often very resource poor uh, organizations and people? My hope would be that as we are taking the food systems dialogues out there, that as independent conversations are happening, that we can actually adopt these conversations to even local communities, much, much, much smaller at, and local and, and small scale. And what would be the nature of the conversation? The nature of the conversation is how we can try to, think, first of all, help these local communities understand what is at stake. Number one, number two, help them understand that they have a role in, in really changing what is at stake, right? Ensuring that we save our environment, ensuring that uh, we do the right thing, ensuring that um, they understand that uh, we can do these things and still be able to deal with hunger and still be able to feed our children right. You know, so I, the, the conversation should be able to give communities an opportunity to understand challenges that they are living with, but also be able to understand if they have some of those solutions within them and where they don't have solutions to be able to look outward and request for support. We want to do ABCD, but we can't be able to do it. So that's where we're talking about transitions. Maybe there are going to be transitions, but can these communities be able to have the transitions by themselves? Or do they need to be working with all of us to support them have these transitions? You know. So I think my, my hope is that when, once those type of conversations happen, then we actually take the, the, we, we actually take the food systems local. We, people are asking themselves, why do we have that patch, patch of land over there? Why is someone cutting a tree? Why is someone doing this and that? When we actually agreed, like in my country, you can't throw plastic down and walk. We've already agreed as a country and not just a law. Individuals tell you, pick that bottle of plastic. It's not supposed to be there. We do that in Rwanda. So when that happens and from in our food system, we know that what we are doing is impacting our system. Then really we, we are owning it. We, we do it now with energy. I mean, you, you sleep in a hotel, but before you, you turn on a tap, you know your responsibility because they've made, they put the information out there for you. Please save water, please save electricity. We need to build this level of consciousness in our, in our food system so that individually we understand our demands, you know, we make such demands. And as, as individuals, the food system translates on your plate, on my plate. The demands we make impact our food system. And we can do something about it for, for those of us who are able to define our plate. 
but we can also help those communities that are living with, with, with the environment as their only source of livelihood. We can help them cope, cope better and take better responsibility because they actually love the environment. They're the best keepers we have, but many times they do what they have to do and what they have to do uh, leads to destruction. Big themes of everyone having a, a role and being outward looking and supporting others coming out very strongly from what you're saying. You mentioned um, Rwanda, uh, your, your country, uh, a moment ago, and I'd like to, to take you back uh, to, to that time, perhaps before this, this current time, with a question from, from Bob, who, who said there's been a remarkable transformation in Rwanda uh, with the country's agriculture. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how that was achieved and has it been sustained? <laughs> I mean, Rwanda has a Minister of Agriculture now who will be able to tell us during our food systems, but in actual, <laughs> that was a long time ago. But, um, but I think the basic things that I've talked about that I would like to go back to is, uh, it's not just Rwanda, any farmer that, is, that has an opportunity to produce more with, with less, because Rwandan farmers have small pieces of land with less, um, you know, can start shifting their, 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 their livelihoods. And let me just paint a, an example for you using Rwanda. You know, many people say, oh no, you guys are uh, going monocrop or whatever. No, the, the most important thing when you, you, you start working with farmers and you want them to adopt seed, improve the seed so that they can produce more with less, you, you show them the value of the seed. Usually that seed is not going to be multiple seeds. It's going to be a certain seed that is scientifically proven to do well, right? It's going to be because they manage their soil in a certain way. It's going to be because they have a good set of agro agronomy and support system. So you put all that together and the farmer can double their yields, can triple their yields. What you're doing right there, you're giving them a choice. You're giving them an opportunity to start thinking what they need. Do they need to do more of that? Do they have enough resources to shift into something else? In the Rwandan environment, for example, every farmer <coughs> that makes some money growing maize wants to buy a cow. <laughs> and the only reason they buy a cow is because they want to improve the nutrition of their soil. They use the manure to improve the nutrition of the soil. Once they do that, the next thing they want to do, they want to go into horticulture because it's more productive in terms of money. They get more money from horticulture in the same piece of land. So again, like I said, I think we, we have an opportunity to, to educate communities and help them access technologies, but the, where they land has to be so a place where, which allows, to, allows them to, to, to really improve their livelihoods, but also to, to, to help them, you know, use the resources they have. So in Rwanda, for example, most farmers, if you ask most farmers, they will probably um, be settling in a horticulture environment, very different than where we started when I was minister, because we were starting from ground zero. Today, they are looking at business. They are looking at how much money they can make from their small pieces of land. So um, there's no permanent situation in agriculture. You can't say we introduced this system and it has to be sustainable. The sustainability of agricultural systems is the ability to provide livelihoods for the people that work in them. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks, Agnes. Uh, to go to another uh, controversial issue, Daisy asks, what are your thoughts on the Eat Lancet Commission's planetary health diet? You'll be familiar with the, uh, the diet um, that was uh, proposed by the Eat Lancet Commission um, involving uh, relatively low meat intake and a uh, plant-based, um, largely plant-based diet. What are your thoughts on that, uh, on that piece yeah. of work? So, so I think the, the Eat Lancet um excuse me, the Eat Lancet Commission did a whole, did a great uh, piece of work. They did a whole lot of reviews and really there's, there's, there's a great scientists behind it and great work that was done uh, and great experts behind it. Uh, now, we need to put things in perspective always, right? So for me, the perspective here is the, the, the while the, all that stuff exists, it needs to be put in context 
in, in, in again, just like food systems now, we took the trouble to try to make sure that we are taking this conversation local. Something, diets have to be taken to local context and give people opportunity to discuss, you know, so, so there's, there's, a, there's a direction and there's, 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 a, there's there are decisions that happen on the ground based on where people are at. So again, in terms of catalyzing conversation and getting things going, it's a great place to start. But these conversations are going to happen locally, are going to have to happen locally. And, and solutions are going to be based on, on, on where people are at and what they need in different times. Yeah, and in these discussions, um, uh, Molly's got a, a question here which is about the fact that um, there are power differences in, in the system. So uh, some people um, engaging in conversations or engaging in, in the dialogues and the processes in the summit uh, will have relatively more power, particularly compared to the people that you've, you've mentioned, people who are citizens or farmers or in communities who are suffering from malnutrition, who are impoverished in some way, and who really have a very little rights, very little voice, very little power. How are you going to make sure that those voices really are central uh, to the summit uh, going forward? Um, you know, one of the things we've done in the summit is first start with that point, the point that um, uh, the community, a lot of, people that are out there impacting and even moving our food systems forward are not necessarily the people that are empowered to be part of these conversations that we are having. So we've been very deliberate around pulling out people and making sure that the representation is real in different groups. For example, in our advisory committee, I, I mentioned that we have different groups that are on the advisory committee, including pharma groups. We have two representatives of pharma groups on the advisory committee, which is the biggest body of, of the summit. And, we, uh, and that goes, you know, um, the, the representations in other places as well. But for me, the most important thing, like I said, is creating spaces for conversation for these communities. Um, we have meetings with indigenous communities. We do have meetings with farmers. We do become very deliberate around ensuring that these conversations are also part of feeding into the summit. So, um, I mean, this is what the summit is about. The summit is about pulling out vo different voices and listening to different voices and ensuring that they have a space and a say in, in the summit. Like I said earlier, my for part of what I would consider my biggest success is to see that some of the game changing ideas that we are putting forward are coming from communities that we don't usually have around the table, because these are the communities that use the land, the indigenous communities, uh, the, the, the farmers themselves, you know, the SMEs that work on the ground, being able to have solutions that are really coming from these people as part of what they live every day would be part of the success of this summit. So I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I, we've structured the, the, the summit so that we can reach people. Thank you, Agnes. And there's another question here about um, the rights framework. Uh, so uh, the questioner, um, uh, Tim asks, he says there's been a, a public letter uh, written by the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food. Uh, outlining some concerns and, and specifically asking about how the summit might integrate a rights-based uh, framework. Um, that question is for you to, to answer separately, of course, um, in response to that letter, but I'm intrigued to know what your perspective is on, on the rights framework and, and how, if and how it can, should be part of this summit. So, um... That's that's a good question. Um, the 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 special rapporteur to 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 human rights is a member of the Food System Summit. He sits on the integrating track of the Food System Summit, which is the place where the action tracks meet. So he he has a huge opportunity to, and that's the reason we asked him to bring out human rights issues that we may that may not be glaringly visible to us because he has better insights and better approach to how these things can be can be addressed. 
the, the, the food systems agenda, the SDG agenda, and the whole idea of reaching people really for me is about human rights, but he has a sharper eye on human rights issues. And we invited him to, be, to come in and be part of advising us on how we can do this better. Now, he has limited capacity, he's stretched. And sometimes um, because he's stretched, he, he, you know, he communicates in a way that he feels needs to reach broader numbers of people. But he has an opportunity to also feed directly to the summit. And that's what we did. We asked him to be part of us so that he can feed without compromising his independence, which I understand 100%, but really be able to tell us where we are coming through and where we're not coming through. And this is paying off because I see that he has had an opportunity to look at the different papers that are being, um, being designed by different action tracks. He's, you know, he has an opportunity to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, engage with them. So I hope that how he's thinking about human rights will be reflected in the meetings he's having with the team because he has, he has inroads to the team that are working on the summit. Thank you, Agnes. We're coming to, to the end now. So I'm just, I wish I could ask all the um, schools of questions that are left. And I do apologize. Uh, I've tried to reflect everybody's spirit of questions in what I've asked you, Agnes, but I'm just going to ask a couple more. And uh, one from Megan here, which is about countries working together. Uh, she says, I understand that this is country level and country context, uh, but she says, I believe that countries have to work together. Um, what's being done to ensure that there are opportunities for countries to engage with each other as part of taking these things forward? There are going to be cases where countries are going to have to, to work together to solve challenges, right? Um, when you look at, at, for example, a continent like Africa, um, the scale at which we'd like things to be done, especially if we are dealing with environmental issues, is going to have to mean that we find countries working together. By the way, the things we are looking to do are not things we haven't thought about before. If you look at, for example, the work that is happening in the Sahel with the Great Green Wall, the, the One Planet um, uh, Summit uh, engages around, is, is an initiative that cuts across a number of countries in, in, uh, next to the Sahel. And those countries are collaborating and working together to come through the Great Green Wall. When you look at how EU is putting together some of its work around how it expects countries to come through from a food systems perspective, uh, from, from a food perspective, from a farm to fork and, and the Green Deal that they have, they have designed, these are frameworks that are bringing a number of countries together to recognize what they share in common and what they can drive together. I think the Food System Summit and some of the actions we take after that will be mostly characterized by those type of uh, cross-country engagements, but also coalitions among partners that don't necessarily, are not necessarily defined by borders, but want to come through uh, in a big way. Uh, thank you. And, um... The, the food system um, is, as we've spoken about, full of, of different people. There are roles and responsibilities. There are different interests. There is lots of opportunity for people to look outwards uh, as well as uh, engaging themselves and supporting others. I, I'd like to, to end by asking you to reflect on how the fact that these sectors have worked, often people work in silos, they work separately uh, to each other. How do you see that um, in the context of the summit, that all of these different types of perspectives and values and interests and policies and programs can come together? But I, th I think my real question, final question for you is, what type of leadership do you think is needed in order to cross these boundaries and all of these groups together. No, thank you. I mean, that's one of the things that I, I think about a lot because uh, I've told you the five objectives of the summit, but having worked at country level, my biggest worry is that um, uh, when I was working at, at the country in the ministry, I, did, I, I, I knew very well, I was extremely aware of how what we are doing in the agricultural sector is impacting the environment. 
how nutrition is part of the problem we have to address even as we are so focused on producing food, how dealing with poverty is part of what we have to address. So there are a number of sectoral issues that have different sectoral issues that have to come together. And for example, in my country, the only way we overcome that was to create an integrated program that allowed ministries to come together and work on, 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 on problems and challenges. I see this in other countries. Norway has put in place a food systems plan that is across eight ministries that I hope can be a good example for others. Ireland has done that. A number of other countries have done, done uh, this type of initiatives that bring several sectors together in, 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 a, in a way really trying to make sure that they avoid silos and try to ensure that they, they complement the complementarities that exist between sectors. So I hope that's the spirit we can take out of the summit. Now within the summit process itself, uh, what we are doing across, across the different action tracks and bringing in the, the scientific community as well is we, are, we, we, we meet, so each track is trying to bring ideas across, across itself. But we, we need to understand that in the real world, in the real world, these ideas are going to have to cut across. So we have what we are calling an integrating track that brings all these leaders together. And in the next one month, we will start a process of looking at game changing ideas that cut across, that are not, that are not reinforcing silos, but are creating opportunities really to, 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 to bring ideas that cut across um, the, the food ecosystem and provide an opportunity for us to, to really um, hit several things at the same time. So it's something that is on our mind. It's something that we are doing. Uh, there's no perfect answer, but at least we are thinking about it. And I hope that we can find solutions to it. Thank you, Agnes. And would you like to, we're at the end now, would you like to add anything or make any, uh, any final remark? No, I, for me, the, the most important uh, thing I would like to add now, is at, at least what I think is the most important thing today is first of all, you had over 200 people at this time of, of the night. For me here it's in Nairobi, it's, it's, it's at night. Um, so the fact that you, you were able to mobilize this number of people is something I really appreciate. And I just wanted to say that um, if there was one thing we could do now, between now and the, the pre-summit, is really to engage around the summit, really to get to inform ourselves what is at stake and really to push, really to, to ensure that our environment, our, our thinking, around the food system and the ecosystem is coming up with solutions to the problems we've been living with, except now we are much more cautious of the fact that we need to come up with solutions to these problems. And we have an opportunity to come through. So just participating in these dialogues, being part of the conversation, being part of finding solutions, demanding that solutions be found is can never, I mean, is probably the most important thing we can do right now. And I encourage everybody that is still online to really take this and take the message out there and ensure that we're engaging so that we can be able to, you know, define a better future for, for, for the future of this world. Thank you very much. Demanding that solutions be found, uh, something we all must do. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Agnes Calabata, for answering such an incredibly large number of questions uh, thrown at you like that. Uh, thank you to our audience for asking such a rich set of diverse questions. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll wish you the, the very best of luck um, with the summit process. Thank you. You, <laughs> you wish us, not me, all of us. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Corinna, for <laughs> thank you for organizing this, and and really thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And again, I would love to do this some more for the next one year. I'm going to do all this stuff until it gets to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thanks for okay. joining. Bye.